courageous of all of us to be here. Uh, I know a lot of us are, are seriously targeted, like our lives. My partner is, is Mexican Palestinian. I'm fighting a life sentence for a brother right now. And we're targeted, and it takes a lot of courage to stand up. So this point of this exercise is to notice you're not alone, and we're doing this together. And even when you're physically alone, be right there with you. Be right there with you. They say life is a game of chess, but no one's man enough to treat us like queens, ladies. Remember, you are queens, and no matter how hard they try, they can never rape the royalty out of you. Pick your crowns up. This one's for me, for you, for her, for them, for us, for the girls relearning how to look themselves in the eye, who stand tall just because a woman should. This one is for the death of my innocence and the birth of my womanhood that will never be stolen from me. Cheers. Welcome to the first ever town hall hearing on girls of color in New York City. I am Joanne Smith. I'm the founder of Girls for Gender Equity. This is a demonstration of what you've come here for. You will hurt today. You will feel connected to these stories. You didn't come here for a show. If you did, you're in the wrong place. You came here for real life and for real strategies for change, for systemic change. This hearing uh, basically began with the observation that the common sense conversation that we've been having in communities of color, the common sense conversation that says, Men and boys are the primary object of racism. Women and girls are doing OK. Women and girls don't need any particular intervention. Women and girls don't need studies. They don't need resources. They don't need programs. So how are we going to work together to make sure that girls and women do not have to wait for the attention they deserve? Well, one of the ways we do it is we don't wait to start talking. We don't wait to get an invitation from the White House or from the caucus to come and tell our stories. We can create spaces to tell our stories. We can find commissioners to hear the stories. We can find experts who have experienced the stories. We can find young women who embody those stories and have overcome them. We can do that ourselves. So that's what we've started to do, right? So we've done this in Atlanta. We've done it in Chicago. We've done it in Los Angeles. And now, thanks to the wonderful partnership with Joanne Smith and Girls for Gender Equity, we're doing it big time in New York. Woo! A lot of times as a young person, I realized that my voice would always be silenced because technically I wasn't educated enough to be put in the position to advocate for myself. And when advocating, I was only put into mental institutions. When advocating, I was only left to be the one who's always loud, the one who has no direction, the one who need medication, and I refuse medication. Because oftentimes in care, that's what you have. You have this mental disability because you face so many traumatic experiences. No, I didn't face traumatic experiences. I faced life in a very different way. I had no face in the foster care system. I saw no care. When I was eight, they didn't help me, so I didn't believe they'll help me now, but my mom needed help. I broke my promise to myself in the 11th grade. I called ACS. I saw my mother relapsing. I met with the caseworker, and I started to tell her my situation. Before I could finish, she asked me, how old was I? I told her 17. She asked me, when will you be turning 18? I told her August. Her response went from apparent willingness to help to We'll see what I can do. From this shift in her energy, I could tell that this was going to be a waste of my time. I wanted you to think about a time in your life when you're moving forward or backwards or staying in the same position and the hinge of your balance of what one person wants to do for you. Uh -huh. That was a very common place that you would be in in the foster care system. It doesn't hit you until it hits home. So you, we have to understand that that little girl next to you on the bus is probably being raped at home, you know? Mm. And we got to stand up to that. We can't, just, mm. um, we can't just see this as a woman's issue because we have to 
have men actually listen to us and stand up with us so this can actually stop and so men can actually tell buyers that no, it's not right to buy a girl and it's not right to buy a nine-year-old and have sex with her and hand her $20 afterwards. It's just mm. not, it's very stupid and it's dumb and we need to stop this now. You know, and criminalization is held between all of us. Women, we get beat for no reason. I was raped when I was nine years old. Nobody was there when I was raped. Nobody helped me. And when I went to the cops, they did nothing. The man is still running the streets. I don't, I don't see why the justice system has, you, you let rapists and you let people that hurt children out on the streets. A guy killed my brother when I was 15, about seven years ago, and they released him. They acquitted him after five years of being in jail. You let killers and rapists on the streets, but you enslaved young people when a lady shot off warning shots in Florida for 25 years. And one thing I wanted to talk about today, you know, is thinking about in all the story, really powerful stories and testimonies we've heard that oftentimes women, in addition to doing these things, are responsible for caretaking, right? So, you know, while we're being harassed by those construction workers, yeah. we're walking home, rushing home often to feed our brothers and sisters that we're, we're responsible for, right? So while we're dealing with being immigrants, xenophobia, the oppression that comes along with maybe being undocumented, we're also running with our mothers to the doctor's office to be translators, That's right. Mm -hmm. right? So while young moms are dealing with being young moms, we're also cleaning up beer bottles maybe from our uncle, mm -hmm. making sure people are coming in safe at night, and this often adds you know, undue pressure in our own lives, right? Potentially you know, pushing us out of school, forcing us to get you know, jobs, second, third jobs, working late into the night while we're still responsible for caretaking. I feel after each of the testimonies, I'm the first one on, and I'm like mesmerized by everything that you're saying and just really taking it all in. I would just say, and, and, I, and I believe that each of the women here would probably share this same type of experience where for me to hear your stories, it's like, it's so inspiring to me because it's like your strength and your courage and your bravery far supersedes anything that I've experienced. And I would say through that, I know that future champions and advocates and allies and organizers are birthed out of this process right. today. Joanne and Kim have given birth to a movement today. And this should be more than just a one-day town hall, but a continuum. In fact, this should be held in every borough in the city of New York. Well, all right. And I don't know about you, but I came as one, as someone stated earlier, and I'll, now I leave as 10,000. So I thank you. I see you. We see you. And I charge, actually, everyone here today, okay? We have letters outside to sign so that Mayor de Blasio, who has brought on My Brother's Keeper campaign and brought on that challenge, right, can hear, and New York City, okay, understand this, is a model city for My Brother's Keeper because of the Young Men's Initiative that Mayor Bloomberg started, right? And because that challenge was brought on here by our mayor, we have a chance to challenge that challenge and bring on a gender inclusive lens. And if we're the model, right, for the nation, let's model how we do this right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's model.